Hi, and welcome back. Uh, this is the last section of our unit on water, and we're looking at water pollution, which is topic uh, 4.4. So what is uh, pollution in the first place? Well, in this class, we're focusing on pollution as um, either biological or physical or chemical. So chemical pollution, pretty obvious things, the, the chemicals that you dump down the sink um, or that are coming from mines or industrial uh, practices. Um, biological can be invasive species. That's often what we're going to be looking at. And physical can be things like noise or thermal pollution that can occur as well. This section is going to focus on four different sections. Um, so the source of that pollution and then the effect of that pollution, how we assess it, and then how we manage it. So four different pieces of this puzzle that we'll get through. So diving right in, when we look at the source of pollution, that's broken down into two different things, inland sources or marine sources. And the first uh, part, when we're looking at inland sources, it's important to note that, well, humans, again, we're at the center of this. And so domestic sewage, um, things like uh, toilet water, essentially, black water, it's also known as sometimes, um, that's the most universal uh, source of water pollution out there. There's a lot of other types of water pollution. And I just listed them very quickly here on the left. You're probably familiar with quite a few of them. Um, if not, just do a quick search for uh, to dig into some of those and you'll, you'll get some more information about those. Marine sources of water pollution, um, well, those are also quite interesting because they're, they're not locked to land. And if we're on land, we're representing a country or a state or a, a city. Whereas if you go offshore, uh, you can go far enough to where it's international waters, and then you start having uh, different countries putting their pollution in these places, and how do you manage that, and who is responsible for managing that? Um, some, th some examples of this would be the dumping uh, of pollutions at sea when we look at radioactive waste. Uh, this was occurring up until 1993. And uh, there were 13 countries involved with dumping their uh, radioactive waste from different uh, reactors, nuclear reactors. And this is extremely toxic, and it sticks around for, for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, we've since stopped that. However, the UN has recently reported that there are cases of this happening off the coast of Somalia. Why Somalia? Because uh, there's not really that much of a functional government in place that can patrol these waters and manage this. So some countries are going there to dump their radioactive waste. Another interesting one is uh, the, the cruise ship industry. If you like going on cruise ships, uh, be do some research and find out how clean that cruise ship line is. Uh, there are reports that some cruise ships dump up to five Olympic-sized swimming pools of sewage, uh, and that's with the water removed out of the sewage, and they dump that off the coast once they hit 20 miles offshore. So you could be on a beach in Florida, and 20 miles offshore, you're getting five Olympic-sized swimming pools of sewage being dumped off per week per boat. There are quite a lot of examples uh, in the news also of water pollution coming from oil explorations and uh, oil spills. Do a bit of research on this one. There's a link here to learn about the timeline of the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there's also another link coming up with the Exxon Valdez oil spill uh, in Alaska. So what's the effect of water pollution? We're going to break this into two pieces, uh, organic and inorganic. And organic is referring to things with a carbon backbone, generally living things. Um, so in this case, they, that pollutant can be broken down uh, and eaten up. And to do that by microorganisms, they need some oxygen to drive that process. Uh, that can lead to something called, in this model right here, that you see something called anoxic conditions. Anoxic, it, it's referring to an environment that has no oxygen. So N without an ox, oxic for oxygen. So that can pull all the, this process can pull all the oxygen out of that environment. Now, if there's no oxygen in that environment, then most organisms will die off because most things need oxygen to survive. We can hit a state down here where you see anaerobic breakdown, um, where organisms start to switch to anaerobic respiration anaerobic respiration uh, is referring to a time when you, you switch from using oxygen to not using oxygen to break down in your cells to break down uh, that material and get some energy out of it. 
So what's the difference between anoxic and anaerobic? Anoxic is an environment where there's no oxygen. Anaerobic respiration is a process inside the cell that's taking place. So it's trying to get energy out of that food without oxygen around. And some organisms can do that. And when they do, they lead down to this next stage down there where uh, methane is a byproduct. Um, hydrogen sulfide and ammonia are byproducts of anaerobic respiration. Um, speaking of methane, you might recall that that's a, a, a greenhouse gas and a very volatile greenhouse gas it absorbs a lot of heat. Um, so you have small bacteria doing this process, burping up methane as they're going through anaerobic respiration in these environments. And eventually uh, these three, methane, hydrogen sulfide, and ammonia can be toxic to other organisms and those things die off. So you remember that plants need some important things to survive, obviously. They need light, they need carbon dioxide. Well, they also need N, P, and K to grow up nice and strong. N stands for nitrogen, P is for phosphorus, and K is for potassium. In this case, what we see in this picture here is something called eutrophication. And that occurs when you get too much N and P and K flowing into these waterways. What happens is the algae in the water loves it. It's a plant, right? These green things, they're doing photosynthesis. So the, this algae grabs into, onto that nutrient and blossoms. They call it an algae bloom or an algal bloom in this case here. And great for the algae. If you're algae, perfect. However, if you're an underwater plant in this environment and there's hundreds and thousands of plants living just below that surface that need the sunlight to survive. Right? They need uh, the carbon dioxide and they need the sunlight. So they're pulling in that sunlight until suddenly the algae goes overhead and shades them and completely shades them. You can imagine this in this part, this lower part of the picture. Well, if those plants die, then suddenly they're not releasing oxygen into the water. They're no longer oxygenating the water and the oxygen level comes down, 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 down in the water. And if it drops below a certain level, well, then fish can't survive because fish have gills and those gills are filtering out the oxygen. So we can completely kill off ecosystems by eutrophication. And that simply is by releasing too many nutrients into these waterways that can come from uh, farms with their runoff. It can come from fields where we're fertilizing because we use a lot of NPK fertilizers to fertilize our giant agriculture. Uh, fields of corn, fields of wheat, all these things, and that can run off into the streams. So when we look at inorganic uh, water pollution, it's kind of a cluster of a lot of things in this unit. Um, we're looking at synthetic compounds. Those are, those are human-made compounds in a lab. Um, they're not existing outside of nature. Uh, oils coming out of oil wells, pathogens, uh, things that are toxic to our bodies, the foreign invaders for our bodies. Um, Plastics, that's a big part of this problem that we see in the oceans right now. Uh, light and noise, those are pollution. We can drive whales and dolphins out of the water and make them beach themselves from, from this type of pollution. Um, and invasive species, we humans move a lot of things around the planet and sometimes those new species end up in an area where they love it, but the local inhabitants really don't like it. And I'll give some examples of that. So I'll share this link to this TED talk in the description below. And uh, it's gonna look at a bit about DDT, PCBs, which are synthetic compounds that we release into nature and how this leads to a problem at the upper end of the food chain, in particular in things like dolphins and killer whales. So let's really look at what biomagnification is. And then please do watch this video. It, it, it'll help you uh, see the real life picture here rather than just see some notes on a page from me. Before I get into biomagnification, which is the lower half of the screen, we should also compare this to what bioaccumulation is, because these two things are sometimes intertwined. Um, bioaccumulation simply is one organism. If I'm, if I'm going out there in a toxic environment uh, and I'm eating a lot of the same thing over and over and over again, let's say I'm eating um, tuna that's contaminated with mercury. A little bit's not going to kill me. A little bit more is not going to kill me. If I eat that sushi, eh, a, little, a little bit more, it's not going to kill me. But if I keep eating that sushi every single day, every single day, I'm going to accumulate the level of mercury in my body. And that can actually become quite bad. Uh, 
down, down the road. So you see that happening in the top side. The biomagnification, I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide, but ultimately it's looking at a food chain and how that toxin it appears to be magnified as you go up the food chain. And this image kind of takes us back and it's a, we revisit um, a food chain moving up a food pyramid here and you have your producers and your consumers uh, moving up along the food chain in their different trophic levels. And the example in this one might be uh, some phytoplankton at the bottom, those that are doing photosynthesis, the little green microscopic organisms in the ocean. And then you have your zooplankton eating them, and then you have some small fish eating them, and then some larger fish, and eventually the, the seagull here is eating the large fish. Well, biomagnification, you can think of it as this red uh, core that I just dropped in there. So a little bit of DDT, which was sprayed in fields. We used to use it a lot uh, to spray for mosquitoes. And this DDT would get in the waterways, and now it ends up in the waterways. And a little bit in the phytoplankton, it's not going to kill them. Well, this is stored in fat cells. So it gets into the zooplankton and stays there. And a little bit, it's not going to kill them. It's accumulating, and they're eating more as they live their life. And then they get eaten by the fish above, and it's not going to kill them. One thing I want you to notice, though, a small band of that red bar in that bottom trophic level is really insignificant. The band doesn't change as you move up. However, the number of organisms that you're seeing eating the, the trophic level below them is changing. And so if you have uh, these large fish eating up all these fish below that are contaminated with DDT, and they're eating more and more, then that concentration of DDT, since it's in the fat cells, not going anywhere, is really magnifying. It's increasing significantly as you go up. So as you move to this top order and you get to these seagulls at the very top, it's really detrimental to them. It damages their eggs and their, their young can die. Look at the TED talk just before this and you'll see uh, how this affects the, the young of dolphins and killer whales because when they get that first blast of milk, well, that's where all those fat cells, a lot of that DDT is stored in the fat and that's coming out in the milk. And so the firstborn usually dies because there's such a blast of DDT in that milk. So looking at another effect of uh, inorganic pollution in the water, uh, there's a link here to an, a disaster that happened quite a while ago, but it was quite major in terms of waking people up to the reality of, of these uh, oil spills and what they actually do to the environment around them and the length of time that they impact the environment around them. And these notes specifically are, are looking at um, the effect of uh, seafaring birds. So when the oil gets into their plumage and what happens, you can have a look there. Have, definitely have a peek at this video because it, it sort of connects you with an early disaster um, and it's relevant today because we have BP that happened not too long ago in the Gulf of Mexico and this won't be the last one unfortunately but it's important to understand how these work and how we can avoid them hopefully in the future. Looking at plastics in particular we hear about things called microplastics. Shockingly there's even uh, microplastics being used as an exfoliant uh, in some soaps like Nivea sells a product with this and they have small, they call them microbeads, like they're fancy. And they put them in the soap and that's supposed to be good for your skin, but they're plastic. And these plastics still end up in the ocean. And the scary thing about plastics is, are these figures that I'm popping up on the screen right now. Um, you have a plastic bag, it'll take about 20 years, depending on the thickness of that plastic bags, to decompose um, plastic bottles. I look around like I would have one, but I won't have one of those in my house, hopefully. Um, 450 years to, to decompose. Fishing line, 600 years to decompose. So these things don't really go away in our lifetime. Uh, and hopefully we can find some alternatives to having these plastics out there in the ocean. And that's coming slowly but surely. And governments are taking stronger stances. And the EU is also uh, implementing laws on the types of plastics that can be used. And we're seeing um, biodegradable bags now in grocery stores throughout the EU. And I think the year is 2021 that that has to be fully implemented, if I'm not mistaken. So we'll stop here on looking at the sources and the effects of uh, water pollution. And next time we'll look at assessing it and managing it. 
So how do we study this? And then how do we actually manage it and reduce the amount of uh, this pollution that we see out there in the environment? Okay, see you next time.